continuing our lecture on Baroque art. So you'll recall last time, or at least from the lecture from last time, that artwork from the Southern Baroque period is extremely dramatic. It's very much about emotions and feelings and portraying them in this very ostentatious, oftentimes like curly and irregular way. We're seeing lots of asymmetry, lots of bright colors, um, high contrast between light and dark, and this is something that we're continuing to see in these other artworks as well. So one of the pieces that we covered last time was the facade of Il Jesu. So this particular artwork, the Triumph in the Name of Jesus fresco by Baxixio, is located right here in the nave of Il Jesu. And it looks like this. So this is a view from the ground looking up. Um, so this is a Baroque painting in a Mannerist slash Baroque building. Um, in the middle of this image right here is the monogram that is oftentimes used to indicate Jesus Christ, um, IHS. It's very bright, so it's difficult to see in this image, but it sort of looks like this. There's also an array of figures below. So this is a um, last judgment scene. We have some figured figures that are ascending into heaven while others are cast down into hell towards the bottom right here. So we have yet again another last judgment scene where oftentimes the, there is this hierarchy in terms of like the people who are being cast down into hell are towards the bottom. They're more towards the entrance of the church by the narthex. And then as you proceed further down the, um, the nave towards the altar, you get to the brighter parts of the composition where people are being saved. One of the most remarkable things about this particular fresco is the fact that it seems to be almost coming off of the ceiling. So this is a combination of trompe l'oeil, which is this technique that was pioneered in the Renaissance, this painting technique that was used to make objects appear as if they were coming forward and towards the viewer, as well as um, a, the use of stucco to add these dimensional elements to the um, molding on the top of the church right here. So there are several sculpted elements that have been added to make these clouds appear as if they're coming towards the viewer. There's also this, um, more specifically within Trompe l'Oeil, this technique called De Soto in Sioux, which is this illusion where um, it seems like figures are on, this, on a ceiling and they're looking down at the people below them. This oftentimes involves lots of like highly technical foreshortening, um, the feet and legs being larger than the heads and torsos. This is called DeSoto and Sue. So the drama and flair that we see in this image is certainly a Bernini influence. We can also see a lot of Bernini influence in the use of this kind of gilded um, bronze and kind of like glitziness in combination with this um, these more white statues. Um, this is probably a classical, um, a reference to classical architecture as well. So here is the um, nave of the Il, of Il Jesu right here. And again, we can see lots of elements on the interior of the church that are referencing this Baroque period. There's lots of curves and irregular shapes. However, in this particular building, we're also seeing lots of elements of architecture that are more um, kind of Renaissance in nature, where they're very orderly. And we see a couple of straight lines, for example, in these pilasters right here, these engaged columns. So this building is representing kind of like a, a mixture between the more the more rational periods of the Renaissance and the more emotional and like undulating curvy motifs of the Baroque period. Here we have some more examples of that De Soto and Sue. Um, like you can see in this image in particular that we're seeing the bottoms of the feet of the figures as well as like we're looking more at like the the bottoms of the chins of the figure. So this is creating the illusion that we're looking up at them. Our next work is Las Meninas by Diego Velázquez. So Velázquez was the court painter for the Spanish royal family during um, a significant portion of the Baroque period. Um, this image is very much a narrative in terms of how it is presented. We have Velázquez right here actually painting himself into this image. He is shown as being in his studio and you'll notice that he has a paintbrush in one hand and a palette in the other. So he's actually engaged in the act of painting. He is engaging directly with the viewer and you can also see this massive canvas right here that is taking up a large portion of the left hand side of the artwork.
So it is implied in this painting that he is actually working on this painting itself. It's a really big painting. It's something like 12 by 10 feet. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, around 9 by 10 feet. My apologies. It's 9 by 10 feet. The figures are probably larger than life. Um, and it is implied that like this is the painting that he is working on right here. So um, what this painting is essentially doing, among other things, is showing Velázquez as a member of this royal posse. We have La Infanta Margarita right here. She is the princess of Spain at this point in time. And then we have her parents actually in this image in the background. It's unclear whether this is a painting that um, Velázquez has done or whether it's a mirror that is reflecting the work that is being done here in, instead of this painting um, right here being this work, it might, this mirror might be reflecting what's on the canvas, or it could be a window. Like, people are not really entirely sure what's going on, and that's part of the mystery and intrigue of this painting and why it's so famous, is that people are kind of unsure of what's going on. Um, Velázquez is also shown with a red cross on his breast. Um, this is signifying his um, posthumous knighthood status. It is actually theorized that this cross was added um, after his death to indicate his status. Towards the end of his life, Velázquez was particularly obsessed with his status and his role within the royal court. He very much liked to associate himself with the royal family and very much saw his position as a, a point of, of pride. So in this image, we have Velázquez right here. We have the king and queen of Spain in La Infanta Margarita, and she is surrounded by her meninas, or attendants. So this is basically like her posse. Um, she has her maid servants right here. And then there's also several other members of the royal court that are involved. She has a dog, and then there are two little people. Oftentimes, little people were brought in and served as companions to members of royalty when they were younger. Um, there's also a couple of chaperones right here. Oftentimes, members of the Habsburg royal family, of which La Infanta Margarita was a part, were outfitted in these extremely elaborate, ostentatious outfits to obscure their physical flaws. Like many other royal families, particularly at this point in time, there was a lot of inbreeding, and as a result, um, a lot of people within these royal families had pretty noticeable physical deformities. One of the most famous of those deformities amongst the Habsburg line was the Habsburg jaw. So there's the significant prognathism or jutting out of the lower jaw. A lot of the Habsburgs basically had lower jaws that were too large for their skulls. So they had a really prominent underbite that would stick out. So perhaps the most famous of the Habsburg line was Charles II or El Echizado, which is Spanish for the cursed one. And one of the reasons that the Habsburgs loved the court painter so much is because they made him probably a little bit more beautiful than they actually were in life. So it is theorized that Charles II was actually a little bit more deformed than this. So you can see he has a pretty prominent lower jaw um, and a pretty large downturned nose. This is probably a sanitized image. You can't really see the Papsburg jaw as prominently in La Infanta Margarita, um, but in several other portraits, her, her lower jaw is protruding quite significantly. So to give you a sense of like the degree of inbreeding that was happening in the Habsburg line, like this is Charles II down here. So this family tree is a family bramble. It is very yikes. So there is this trademark tenebrism that is being used, this very dark background. And then there's also like a, a very significantly large portion of the canvas that is shrouded in darkness. So we're seeing a lot of parallels between this work and then the kind of artwork that we're seeing from artists like Caravaggio. The composition is also highly unusual for this time, especially um, for depicting members of royalty. Typically a member of royalty would be taking up virtually the entire canvas and they'd be depicted as the largest and hi hierarchically the tallest figure in this painting. Um, by all accounts, Counts, Velázquez has painted himself as the tallest figure in this composition. So this is um, pretty unusual. This is actually um, a painting that was located in the King's study during his lifetime and it's now in the Prado. 
So this is a close-up of the lower half of Las Meninas. You'll notice that also the scene is quite candid. Um, it almost is photographic in nature in that certain parts of the painting are blurred. You'll notice in the hands in particular, when you look at Velasquez's hands, as well as the hands of the handmaiding right here, and then these figures in the back, that they're sort of blurred. It's almost like they're in motion. Like there's a, this snapshot in time of this particular moment rather rather than this perfect composite image that is showing a, a very tailored and heavily edited image of the royal family. So it's, it's very much intended to be this snapshot and insider perspective into life at the royal palace. It's also creating this illusion of depth. The figures in the foreground are more detailed and larger than the figures that are towards the back. So this creation of a, a three-dimensional space with depth um, is oftentimes done by having objects in the back be blurrier and smaller than objects in the front. This creation of the illusion of depth and space in a painting it, using these methods is called atmospheric perspective. It's creating an atmosphere where there's a clear foreground, middle ground, and background. Our next work is Henry IV Receives the Portrait of Marie de Medici, which is one of 22 paintings, I need to fix this, in a series retelling the life of Marie de Medici, who was the Queen of France and the wife of Henry IV. So this uh, sequence of paintings was done by Peter Paul Rubens and his studio. Peter Paul Rubens was extremely busy and he oftentimes only painted the faces, hands, and a couple of details in the painting and then he had a couple of people in his workshop that would basically do the rest. So this was not uncommon for particularly prolific artists of the time to like leave the 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 more kind of like busy work to uh, the members of the studio. So interestingly, most of the figures in this painting are seem to be rather candid. They're not necessarily engaged with the viewer. However, there are two figures that are. One of them is Marie de Medici, who is depicted in this painting right here at dead center. And then also this cherub right here. And they're located kind of like one on top of the other. So this painting is a lot about axes. So we have this axis, this vertical axis that is drawn between Marie de Medici and Juno, a.k.a. Hera. And then we, of course, have another axis between Marie de Medici and this little cherub right here. Um, what this piece in is intended to do is really to serve as a sort of propaganda. So Marie de Medici actually commissioned these portraits and they were intended to serve as really her legacy and kind of like evidence of her impact and, and accomplishments during her lifetime. And most historians are of the consensus that these artworks were not super realistic in terms of depicting her achievements and in fact kind of glorified them and over exaggerated them. There's also this very clear intention to show members of royalty as being almost godly in terms of their status. Um, a couple of things exemplify this. For one, we have Jupiter and Juno, aka Zeus and Hera, in the top left hand corner. So these are like the king and queen of the gods in the Greek and Roman pantheon, and they're shown by their godly attributes. Zeus is oftentimes depicted as an eagle, and then um, Hera is oftentimes depicted with um, peacocks. And they are holding hands and gazing down upon the scene below them. This is Henry IV right here, and he is gazing adoringly at this portrait of Marie de Medici. We have um, the figures of Cupid right here and Hymen, who are associated with God and or, or associated with love and marriage. And they're kind of like gesturing towards him. Like we have Cupid looking very cheeky, like, hmm, look at her. She, yes, she's very sexy. And then we, of course, have this allegorical figure of the country of France who is behind Henry IV and kind of whispering in his ear and being like, 
hmm, she's really pretty and marrying her would be of pretty big political advantage because you'll no longer be at war. And then also you're marrying a Catholic and you're Protestant. So that's going to reduce some of the tensions that are happening in the South. So this is an advantageous marriage for you to undergo. And then we have, of course, have this godly endorsement of this union down here. There's also these two little pooties or angels right here who are playing with um, Henry IV's armor. And they're, he's basically cast this armor aside in favor of gazing upon his future wife. So the depiction of Zeus and Hera in this particular image might surprise some of you, especially if you have any knowledge of Greek and Roman mythology and you're like, wait, didn't Zeus sleep with like every other woman in the pantheon except for his wife? And yeah, so basically Zeus was famously um, unfaithful to Hera. And this was quite ironic as Henry IV was famously unfaithful to Marie de Medici as well. Some records suggest that he didn't even show up to his own wedding. So this was kind of this, this hilarious irony it might have been kind of cheeky on um, Peter Paul Rubinson's part. We're not entirely sure. But the intention here, at least on Marie de Medici's part, was to show this kind of like perfect union of these two very powerful godly figures in this top left hand corner and then to parallel the union of two very powerful people in the lower right quadrants as well. So this was actually one of 24 paintings um, that Marie de Medici um, commissioned for this particular space. It was intended, of course, to glamorize and permanently establish her legacy, um, draw parallels between royalty and the gods, and to show that this marriage was divinely um, sanctioned and politically advantageous. And here are the pooties, one of which is staring directly at the viewer. There's also this burning city in the background, which doesn't really fit the mood of the rest of the painting. This was intended to basically serve as the depiction of war that Henry IV is leaving behind in favor of pursuing love. We are now going to be moving on to Baroque painting in Northern Europe. So you'll recall that there is this division between Northern and Southern Europe um, as a result of the counter of the Reformation and the in um, ensuing Counter Reformation. So because of this, we're going to see a lot of cultural differences between the North and the South. Um, so at this point in time, of course, Holland is Protestant, and then France and Italy are Catholic. You'll recall that. Um, and the, the Catholic faith at this time was very much about like glitz and glamour and showing the glory of God by commissioning these very large and like glitzy works, whereas the North was more concerned with a more subdued piety or in a lot of cases foregoing religious imagery altogether or making it more subtle. So in the North, we see the sense of scale being reduced quite significantly. A lot of the works from the Baroque period in Northern Europe are quite small. Um, in contrast, a lot of the works from the Southern Baroque are quite large. The figures are at life scale or even larger. Like the Marie de Medici painting, um, the figures are about life size. In Las Meninas, the figures are about life size. Same thing with Caravaggio's work. So the settings are a lot smaller and they're also a lot less glitzy. You're not going to be seeing these gigantic curling, undulating curves. The work is less dramatic in the sense that it's like big and flashy, but rather that it's small and dark and intimate. So um, we're also not seeing the um, this like grand scale and volume, even though the economy is doing well in a lot of these northern areas, it's more understated. You might see a little bit of gold or like some like notions of prosperity or fertility that are being used in images, but they, they're still very understated. And there's also this notion that like this, this beauty, this, this wealth will not necessarily last forever. We also see the emergence of several different kind of like genres of painting in the North that we don't really see in the South as frequently. Remember that in the North, we're not seeing that much art that is commissioned by the church. So the people that are able to commission art at this point in time are usually members of the wealthy merchant class. A lot of the artworks that are being produced at this time are a lot more secular in nature. A lot of them are going to be portraits of people um, or um, images that are like still life so paintings of like objects and then also landscapes 
There's a lot of symbolism that is implied in these images, so we're kind of carrying over from those trends that we saw in the Northern European Renaissance. And there's also a lot of suggestion of higher meaning. Like you might see a painting of fruit, but there's this subtle imagery to be like, oh, there's grapes. That must be the blood of Christ or something. There's also um, some kind of like less subtle hints. Sometimes you'll see a painting and then there's like, you'll see like a cross in the corner or like a tree is in the shape of a cross or you'll see like a Last Judgment painting. Like it's very subtle, but there's still kind of like these religious undertones that are present in a lot of the imagery. So our first work in this section is Self-Portrait with Susika, which, which is by Rembrandt. So this is an etching, which is an image created by um, carving into a piece of metal with a stylus um, and then using acid to etch the lines and incise them into the surface. So this particular image shows Rembrandt in um, non-contemporary clothes. So this clothing was of... A, an earlier time. It's a little bit foppish, probably something that you would have seen in the Renaissance. He's also depicting his wife, Sasika right here. At this particular point in time, they had been married for about two years. So Sasika appears in many of Rembrandt's works. She was actually a model for many of his um, larger and more involved pieces, but this is the only known sketch where he's actually depicted the both of them in the same piece. You'll notice that this piece is quite informal. Um, it's very sketchy. It's certainly not a piece that most artists would consider complete and something that was intended to be like a masterwork. It was probably a sketch that he just did to warm up or to have some sort of memento. It wasn't intended to be a public work that something or something that was sold. Um, this is also very much indicated in the um, kind of like the use of proportions which are somewhat off. You'll notice that Rembrandt's hand is quite small um, and that his lower body is, is pretty small in proportion to his head. So this is something that he probably did freehanded without kind of like sketching out the composition beforehand. Um, so that's one of the reasons that the proportions might be off. Also, the fingers are not modeled to the degree that he was certainly able to at this time. So um, this is a very private and domestic moment. It is like many other works from the Baroque period, this like captured moment in time it's almost like we're, we're walking in on this this domestic moment at the table and they're like what are you doing here so you'll notice that Rembrandt uses several different techniques to suggest shading he is using hatching or these um, close parallel lines to indicate shading in some areas and then he's um, crossing some of those lines in other portions. This is called cross hatching to deepen the shade and shading in others. So these are common techniques that are used by artists to sketch in tones when they don't necessarily have paints nearby. So you're kind of draw you're kind of shading in with line. Our next work is Woman Holding a Balance by Johan Vermeer. So there are actually not that many of Vermeer's paintings that have come down through the centuries. Um, it is theorized that he um, did not attribute all of his works during his lifetime. A lot of his artwork was also for rich patrons and might have been lost. So there's around 70 of his works um, that are, are known in the 21st century and are um, very popular in museums. One of his most famous works that you'll probably recognize is The Girl with a Pearl Earring. So this is one of many of Vermeer's paintings that explores the intimate and sparsely um, illuminated interiors of Dutch homes. So there's one single light source in this image. It's very similar to the calling of St. Matthew in the sense that we have this window that is serving as a single light source. And th most of the room is shrouded in darkness, but we have this very strategic lighting that is being cast upon this figure right here, as well as um, some of the jewelry and gold in this box. And then on the corners of this frame in the background right here. The perspective of this interior is very clear. We can see grid lines in the floor. We can also see the vanishing point, which is ending up right around here towards the center of the painting. Um, and then we can also see it in the lines that are being created on the wall by this mirror right here. Interestingly, the dead center of this painting is right at the center of this balance. And this balance is really serving as the focal point and like focal message of this painting. This sense of a kind of like a balancing of the scales, this judgment between good and evil, this balance of 
uh, wealth and religion that is certainly being implied as well. This is not just like a pretty domestic scene of an interior with uh, like a lady holding her her balance and looking at her jewelry. There's certainly some some undertones that are being suggested here. One of the most obvious ways that this is implied, of course, is this Last Judgment painting um, right behind her, right here. We have Jesus in this medallion right here, and then the saved are rising to heaven, and then the damned are descending into hell. We have yet another last judgment scene i think we have like eight of them total in this in this portion of the curriculum so vermeer was really an expert of of texture and creating images where you could um very much get a sense of the the kinds of like fabrics and the the lighting the interior lighting of the space he was very detail oriented in that sense um so we can see this kind of like um, fluffy, furry texture on the lining of this jacket. Uh, we can also see this um, kind of cloth cap on her head is very starchy and kind of wrinkled in the corners. Um, we can see the soft velvet of this drapery right here. Like it, it's really masterfully executed. All right. So this piece, of course, is rife with symbolism. We have the Last Judgment behind her. Interestingly, the saved are on the left, like where she is facing, and then the damned are at her back and furthest away from the light right here. Um, she, of course, is bearing these scales, which symbolize weighing or judging. Um, a lot of people have theorized that the figure in this painting is pregnant, while others are like, that was just kind of the style in Northern Europe at the time, was to have a very tightened bodice and have the um, stuff below the waist being let out. Um, there's also this gold jewelry and fine clothing, and then the figure is also this very young, beautiful woman. This is oftentimes referring to the theme of vanitas, which is the folly of vanity and the brevity of life. Basically saying, like, kind of like the Robert Frost poem, nothing gold can stay. Like, things will be perfect for a short amount of time, and, like, there's this specific moment where, like, things haven't been decided, and things are kind of in balance, and then things fall out of balance. So here's a close-up. Um, most of Vermeer's paintings are quite dark and muted. However, he loves to highlight using blue and gold. Um, and then again, here's a bit of a closer view of the Last Judgment painting right here. Our last work in the Baroque unit is by Rachel Roish. It's called Fruits and Insects. This is our one lady artist in the unit, I believe. So very few women were artists at this point in time for a couple of reasons. Um, for one, they were required to serve as apprentices under a master. And of course, most of the masters um, were men. So, and if you were an unmarried woman, you were basically not allowed to be um, with a man unless you were supervised. So it was very unusual for a woman to be able to apprentice under a man and become a painter. However, Roish was um, from a particularly high class family. Um, she was able to afford kind of like this individual training. And her father was also an anatomist and a botany professor. So he had access to lots of materials, um, including specimens, as well as textbooks that included these highly detailed illustrations of um, like different animals, plants, insects, and so on. So she had lots of reference materials to work with when she was painting. So this image right here is not necessarily something that she would have set up in a studio and painted. Rather, it is an arrangement of objects in this kind of fantastical outdoor woodland setting. She has arranged um, a selection of fruits as well as a couple of animals and insects in the foreground right here. And she's created this kind of like perfect scene. It's capturing this moment in time. We have like a fly that is landing on one of these fruits. Um, we have a butterfly that is about to land and is maybe like, mm, I don't want to land here. There's a lizard that's about to eat me. So it's very much capturing this moment in time, this, this perfect composite image of all of these really delicious looking foods. So this is something that was pretty highly desirable during the Baroque period in nor Northern Europe. People really loved having images in their home of this delicious looking food. Um, a lot of times it was to suggest prosperity. Also being able to afford a painting with this degree of detail um, was definitely a status symbol at this point in time. 
And of course, we have this very subtle use of symbolism. Um, in this particular case, we have grapes, which are oftentimes associated with the blood of Christ. Like this is um, this wine is my blood, kind of like this stuff that was said during the Last Supper. And then there's also some wheat as well. And wheat is associated with those like little wafer crackers, like the body of Christ, the Eucharist. <laughs> 